Uh, welcome to our fourth session of the SAFI UAE webinar series. Uh, my name is Alejandro Rios. I am uh, the director of the Sustainable Bioenergy Research Consortium at Khalifa University of Science and Technology. Today we have, um, as I mentioned, our fourth session for our SAFI webinar series in which the title is Global Lessons uh, for Sustainable Aviation Fuels. What um, I will be introducing each of our panelists, we have a, an excellent lineup of, of panelists uh, today. We have um, Mariam Alkubasi from Etihad Airways. We have Arvid uh, Lukin from uh, Avenor, the Norwegian uh, airport uh, operator. We have Sean Newsom from the Boeing company, who uh, is in charge of environmental strategy. And then we have Darren Morgan, who is uh, at Sky Energy, and he heads uh, the growth and investment area for Sky Energy. So um, today we will be looking at different perspectives from the sustainable aviation fuel industry. We have an airline perspective, we have an airport perspective, we have a, a perspective from uh, the largest aircraft manufacturer in the world, and then we have a perspective from a jet fuel or sustainable aviation fuel distributor, the largest distributor or the, the, the biggest distributor there is today. And so without further ado, I will go ahead and read for you the short bios of each of our panelists before we begin. So, um, Mariam Alkubezi is heading sustainability under government, international affairs and communications in Etihad Aviation Group. Before that, she worked as an instructor in the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies at Syed University, where she taught environmental and natural sciences. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Health from Syed University and a Master's of Philosophy in Engineering for Sustainable Development from the University of Cambridge. Her research interests include water resource management, environmental policy, and innovation and technology management. Arvid Lokin, uh, it works as senior advisor in Avenor's carbon reduction program. His main responsibilities are jet biofuel and R&D projects. He has a background from innovation funding and innovation projects. He has worked eight years as senior innovation advisor in Nordic Innovation, an organization owned by the five Nordic ministries of industry, working to promote growth and sustainability in the Nordic region. He holds a master's degree in economics and resource management and an MBA. Sean is director of environmental strategy at Boeing Commercial Airplanes. In this role, he leads a team that addresses key industry-wide environmental issues, including aircraft emissions and community noise reduction, biofuel development, and other opportunities to enhance commercial aviation's environmental performance. Sean is also responsible for developing an integrated strategy to ensure that products and services are aligned with the company's environmental objectives. He represents Boeing in the Committee on Aviation Environmental Protection and is a member of the Air Transport Action Group Board of Directors. And then uh, Darren, Darren Morgan, joined Sky Energy in 2018 from the Boeing Company, where he was Director of Sustainable Aviation Fuels for 12 years. At Boeing, he was one of the primary aviation industry architects of the emerging soft industry and has been involved in or founded many of the significant aviation fuel efforts to date. Prior to this, he led the selection of new energy projects at Puget Energy. Darren excels at building coalitions that include financial, political, industrial, technical, academic, and non-governmental organizations. And so with this, I would like to turn the floor or the microphone over to Mariam, who will give us um, her perspective from the airline point of view on what uh, Etihad Aviation Group has learned in their uh, significant experience in, in the use and um, commercialization, or well, not commercialization, but in the use of sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, thank you, Mariam. Thank you, Dr. Alejandro. Can everyone hear me? Perfect. Can you see my slides? 
we can see a, I can see a blank screen, perhaps. Okay. Yeah, you can do that again. For some reason, it's not loading. No, it's not. No? Um, okay, if I put the white screen one, one last time. I guess, uh, um, Mariam, uh, unfortunately, we're having technical issues. So perhaps um, we can go ahead and start with um, Arvid's presentation, if, if you have it online, Arvid. And Mariam, what we can do is that you can send it via email to me and we can try, I will try projecting it while you speak. Is that okay? So Arvid, can you please go ahead? Uh, yes, I'll try to share my screen right here. Um, can you now see my presentation? Mm, no, I cannot see it. Uh, okay, <laughs> and I guess it's the same because uh, I tried pushing on share screen one and now it's on my screen, but uh, um, Okay, um, what if I do it a different way? Um, should be work. But what now? Um, uh, we can see a logo. There. There it is. There it is. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Arvid. Go ahead. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, I represent uh, Avinur, uh, which is a state-owned uh, company. We own and operate 44 airports uh, in Norway. Um, that's uh, quite a lot for a country with about uh, 5 million inhabitants. It has to do with uh, long distances and rough geography. So traveling by car or plane takes a long time. So I think it's fair to say that uh, aviation, uh, that Norway is totally dependent on aviation. Um, um, next slide. Um, when it comes to our own emissions, Avinur has committed to be net zero carbon by 2030. Uh, and as this picture illustrates quite a large share of airport emissions are related to snow removal. I guess this is uh, one of the areas where we differ a bit. Um, and uh, we reduce emissions by electrifying what's possible and phasing in bio for the rest. But of course, the big emissions come from air traffic, not from airport operations. And good things are uh, happening. Today's uh, new planes are much more efficient than planes built 30 years ago. Emissions per passenger kilometer have fallen by more than 50% over the last 20 years. Um, and uh, Avinur has for more than 10 years taken an active role in reducing emissions from the aviation industry. Uh, lately, we've been working quite a lot with the introduction of electric aircraft. So Avinur's uh, vision is uh, domestic aviation electric by 2040, 20 years from now. But the topic of today uh, is uh, sustainable aviation fuel, uh, SAF. Uh, it was back in 2007 uh, that Avinu started monitoring uh, the development, the technical uh, development of SAF. Uh, and in 2014, we had our first flights on bio here in Norway, SAS and Norwegian. Uh, and in 
January 2016, Avinor at Oslo Airport was the first hub in the world to blend jet biofuel into the fuel infrastructure at the airport and to offer jet biofuel to all airlines tanked at the airport. So this was a cooperation project with uh, SAS, KLM, Lufthansa Group, and AirBP and Sky Energy. And the conclusion was, this works very well, no real problems. Uh, to go into the technicalities, uh, this uh, was based on Camelina oil from the EU project Itaca, uh, ground on semi-arid areas, refined by Nestle in Finland. Uh, and another batch was to use cooking oil, Yuko, from Altair, No World Energy in, in California. Uh, and this, um, um, we're quite proud of this, this project and being first in the world for this. Um, and uh, from 2020, Norway is also first in the world uh, to implement a drop in mandate for. For aviation. Uh, the requirement is for half a percentage this first year with a goal of 30% in 2030, only 10 years from now. And the requirement is for advanced bio only waste and residues. That's been important for sustainability reasons. So for all, this is applicable for all fuel sold to civil air traffic, domestic and international. Um, and as the amount sold uh, at Norwegian airports today is a bit more than a billion liters a year in the normal years. Uh, the estimate was this would require around 6 million liters uh, this first year, but of course 2020 has been a special year for aviation. Hey, uh, uh, Arvid, sorry, but uh, sure. your microphone I think is, is uh, not working. Uh, it, it, sometimes you fade away, so can oh, you just... Yeah. Sorry for that. Um, okay. Um, I think it's better now. Yes. Okay, good. Um, Avinor has, um, has also engaged uh, quite a bit in research projects and in analysis projects. Uh, we have on a regular basis provided information about emissions, traffic projections and plans to reduce emissions together with our domestic airlines and the Confederation of Industries. Uh, we have also undertaken a quite large project to analyze the potential for local production of sustainable jet fuel. Uh, and the report concludes that there is enough waste and residues from Norwegian forests to cover 30 to 40 percent of the jet fuel need. And in the longer perspective, marine resources like algae could be interesting. But right now, I guess imported fuel based on used cooking oils and animal fats are more realistic. So we want to ensure sustainability and supply and to see local value creation. Um, my last uh, slide, um, a bit about uh, the challenges that we see um, ahead. Demand will increase substantially. People will continue to travel and the goals and obligations of the Paris Agreement must be reached. New types of fuel on a much larger scale are needed. But it is unlikely, unlikely that the price of bio will ever fall below the price of fossil. So policy and incentives are needed. And uh, policy and incentives that work internationally are, uh, are easier to, to deal with than the national policies and incentives for reasons of competition. Um, my projection is that uh, we will need all the biomaterials we can get hold of. There is a need to develop new types of technology to be able to utilize new types of bio. And there are still very few production facilities that produce sustainable aviation fuels. But there are a number under planning and construction. Um, and um, the last point, sustainability. That must not be forgotten or compromised in order to increase uh, supply. Um, so I guess I'll leave it um, at that uh, in this first round and uh, look forward to the 
panel discussion afterwards. Thank you very much, Arvid. Uh, I think you, you gave us a, a very good overview of what Avinor is doing and, and the efforts that you have been involved with. It is a significant undertaking, as you have very well pointed out. And it's a big, big, big challenge. I think that, you know, we all recognize the, the price uh, gap uh, problem. Uh, and I think that Darren will be able to, to speak to that a little bit uh, later on. Uh, but we will certainly uh, go into the discussion and, and try to address those those four points that you raised in this last slide. Thank you very much. Um, so we're now going to be moving to or moving back to um, to Mariam. If you are able to project your <laughs> your slides now, can you check, please? Yes, and but you are muted, Mariam. So. Sorry about that. Can you guys hear me now? We can hear you and we can see your slides. If you can put it in presentation mode, it'd be that perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So my name is Mariam. Greetings, everyone. Um, I'd like to talk about, before I talk about the case for Safi, I hope it's okay if I um, turn off my uh, uh, camera, if that's okay. Okay. So before I talk about Safi, I'd like to take you back to Etihad, um, its beginnings, and some facts about the organization. So um, Etihad is relatively a very young carrier. It started operating in 2003, and I really think it has come a long way, um, 17 years forward. Um, Etihad is one of the, I think, was the first uh, carrier in the Middle East to introduce SAFs, um, and I'll talk about this shortly. But let me give you some background about um, the company and uh, really um, some stats. Etihad has over 20,000 employees, diverse employees from 151 countries. Uh, we have a very large network. Uh, we operate in 76 destinations across 49 countries. Now, this is something we're very proud of. We are considered one of the large operators, so we actually have more than 100 aircraft. Now, most of which are 787s, um, which is considered the most efficient uh, aircraft. Uh, I'm sure my uh, counterpart in uh, Boeing is uh, going to attest to that. Um, it's 15% uh, more efficient than any aircraft we operated in Etihad. Um, soon to be, I think, 50% uh, of our fleet by 2035. And I must point out that we do have an, a relatively young fleet of five years of age. In, in our team, sustainability, we look at three main things, regulatory compliance, education and awareness, and emission control. And this really is, emission control is where SAFs play a big part. If I take you through the journey of Etihad sustainability, I have to go back to 2009. Um, 2009 was a quite a turning point for the United Arab Emirates. Um, sustainability became a very, very important topic, quite the hottest topic on the agenda. Um, we were about to uh, inaugurate the world's first carbon neutral city, um, not to mention uh, many uh, projects, including a civilian nuclear program um, and many renewable projects, new, renewable energy projects. So in 2009, and as early as 2009, Etihad joined um, uh, uh, the SAFUG, which is the Sustainable Aviation Fuel User Group. And um, Basically, by default, this has bound us to investment, investing in sustainable alternative or aviation fuels. And in 2011, the SBRC, which I'll speak about shortly, and uh, we have Dr. Alejandro here, who is the, the director of the SBRC. Um, and in 2012, and this is where my, my infographic starts, we had our first uh, delivery flight of a 777 from Boeing uh, to, do, to the United Arab Emirates using, um, sorry, using uh, biofuel. 
And this was sort of um, the first time in the Middle East, um, uh, a Middle Eastern carrier uses sustainable alternative fuel. Um, I'll jump across to all the fuel related topics. So, and then let me take you to 2011, sorry, to, to 2014, where we had the Biojet project, um, where again, we had a demonstration of using plant-based uh, um, uh, biofuel. And then let me take you to 2020, uh, to, to, oh God, 2019, when we had our first locally sourced uh, biofuel or um, uh, plant-based, salicornia-based fuel uh, in uh, a flight we operated in Jam of 2019. And then, of course, there are the other um, um, uh, fuel-efficient um, uh, activities we did where we would try to reduce weight, single-use plastic, and then let me take you to 2020, when we welcomed um, our hero aircraft, the Green Liner, um, which is a 787 dream, uh, Dreamliner from Boeing. And the delivery flight included 30% biofuel blend. And we can project the, uh, the infographic forward to our 2035 goal, which is to reduce our, carbon, our, our 2019 emissions by 50% and hopefully be carbon neutral by 2050. So our carbon emissions targets, there is a 50% reduction for, by 2035. And as I mentioned, we, we, we plan to be carbon neutral by 2050. And we, we really, I mean, we really aim at doing this by looking at SAPs, carbon offsets and innovation whether in operational innovation or, you know, fuel development, SAF development, um, and obviously waste reduction. I'll very briefly go through the SBRC. This uh, was uh, founded uh, mainly by uh, Khalifa University, Etihad, and Boeing, and it looked into producing biomass uh, that can be converted into sustainable alternative fuel. some of the project, the, uh, the pilot phase project. And then Etihad uh, with Boeing had the Greenliner program. As I mentioned, the Greenliner program is another name for the, the 787 Dreamliner program where we have with Boeing, where we're looking into um, uh, uh, making AB, uh, our, our uh, uh, activities more, uh, our ops uh, more sustainable um, by looking at biofuels, um, uh, single-use plastic reduction, and overall weight reduction, not to mention other operational efficiencies. And then another angle to sustainable alternative or sustainable aviation fuel is waste to fuel. And this is a project I believe Dr. Alejandro alluded to, talked about the options the UAE has. This is one of them waste to fuel. So in 2019, Etihad signed um, uh, an MOU with uh, the Waste Management Center in Abu Dhabi because Abu Dhabi was required to, to divert 20, 75% of municipal solid waste away from landfills by 2040. And what an opportunity this presents for us to use that waste, municipal solid waste, to, 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 to convert it to fuel. The point I want to make here is in order for us to do, to, to move forward, I think we have to look at collaborations. And I'm glad, and, I'm, and I actually look forward to hearing Darren's view because he's built, he, he works in forming coalitions. And I think Etihad has an excellent track record so far, but my God, what can we achieve with what, how I, I can only imagine what can we achieve when we have Safi? operating in the UAE or in the region. I mean, if I look at the UAE as an example, and I think we, we live in a very interesting um, region where things can happen. Um, this is a very young country that has come a long way. And I mean, we're not only do we have nuclear power, 
civilian nuclear power that is uh, we're, we're, we also have uh, we're, we're, I mean we're, we, we started our space operations so this is the place where things can move and move quickly and I think if anything this could be excellent breeding ground for Safi and to see it come through so I'll leave it here and yeah I'll I look forward to the discussion thank you Thank you very much, Miriam. Um, I think you, you, you've done a, a very good job of uh, talking about all of the different efforts that Etihad uh, Aviation Group, Etihad Airways, has, has been working on for many, many years. And I think that, it, without a doubt, Etihad is one of the leading airlines in this space, and, and it's very good that it's in this region of the world. Um, so now I would like to turn, turn it over to, to Sean. Sean Newsom will talk about all of the efforts that the Boeing company has been working on, uh, you know, all over the world. Um, and I'll let uh, Sean, uh, you know, tell us about it. Thank you, Sean. I think uh, you're on mute or we can't hear you. I think uh, we have a problem with your phone. Can you hear me? Found it. Okay. There it is. Got it. Okay. So uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, wherever everybody is. Um, pleasure to be here. It's morning for me. And so apologies if I'm a little slow on the uptake here. Um, Obviously, we're, we're operating in a very different world right now with, with COVID greatly impacting the, the aviation industry um, and, and the global economy and really every aspect of, of life. Um, but despite those, those global impacts um, around COVID, the concern around climate has, has not changed. Um, if anything, um, in, for some people, this is, um, reinforces their beliefs of taking action towards climate change even stronger and so from an aviation industry standpoint, it, it, our, our commitment to addressing climate change, to taking action to address climate change has not changed um, one bit. Um, we, we established three goals a long time ago, over a decade ago at this point. Um, the key one being, the key long-term goal being a 50% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2050. Um, that goal, um, which, we, which, which we said over a decade ago, relied on sustainable aviation fuels in order to, to get there. That we continue to invest in new airplane technology, we continue to, to try to operate those airplanes more efficiently, and we do great things to reduce, to avoid the CO2 emissions coming out of the tailpipes of the airplanes, to limit the growth of CO2 emissions but we knew then and we know now that those those levers are not enough that doing additional things such as sustainable aviation fuels such as carbon offsetting are necessary to achieve a 2050 goal of 50 percent reduction or really any goal of, of that magnitude um, there's been a number of studies over the past 12 months 15 months 18 months i guess we're into august of 2020 now um, by various consulting agencies, third parties, um, given the, the focus that was put on aviation and climate change in 2019. And without exception, every one of those studies has pointed to sustainable aviation fuel being critical, being an essential component for hitting any um, ambitious 2050 target. Despite the, the increased focus on electrification of aviation, despite um, a growing interest in, in hydrogen applications into aviation, the use of sustainable hydrocarbon fuels over the long term has been deemed essential in every one of those studies. So that this roadmap that we put forth over a decade ago remains true today. Um, this, this is a picture we've used for, for quite some time and it still re remains relevant. Over the, the past decade, uh, going on 15 years, I guess, at this point, um, we've done a lot of work across the industry to prove that avi sustainable aviation fuels are, are viable. 
um, we've got to the point where we know they're, they're technically viable, that they're approved for use on, on, on airplanes up to 50% on a drop-in basis. You all know that. Um, that's, what, that's what makes them the most viable path going forward out to 2050 is because of that infrastructure compatibility at both the fuel and distribution infrastructure level and at the airplane level. It's a way of reducing the, the net emissions of the fuel by up to 80% today, perhaps more in the future, um, while maintaining the same infrastructure of, of the airplane and, and fuel distribution. That's really critical in having um, broad applicability to reduce the emissions of, of our industry over the long term. Over the ensuing decade, we've also um, been able to prove that fuels can be produced sustainably, that the Roundtable on Sustainable Biomaterials is a um, essentially gold standard third party certification for sustainability of biomaterials, including biofuels. And there's a number of pathways, a number of feedstocks that have been proven and certified to that RSB standard. We know that that's possible. We know that it's possible to, to um, provide food security, to provide, to protect land use change issues, to address water supplies. Um, we know that we can produce these fuels sustainably. There's been a number of studies over the, the, the last decade looking at the feedstock availability. We know there's enough feedstock available around the world to produce enough fuel to meet aviation's long-term demands out to 2050. We know that it can be produced um, on a commercial basis. There's at least, I think, two or three active producers, depending on how you um, assess commercial scale um, today, that are um, operating and even expanding their operations. So the, the key here is, it's not whether it can work, it's not whether this is possible, it's turning the possible into probable. And incentives and investments are the, the key tools that we have that are, that are needed to scale production to what we need over the long term. As Boeing, we've, we've made a point of focusing on collaboration. Um, Darren was the leader of our biofuel program for over a decade. Um, he set up this, this collaboration model for Boeing and it's been emulated around the world. The, the SBRC project in the UAE is one of our signature collaboration projects with Boeing and we're very proud to be part of that. Um, but it's not the only one and it, it will take lots of collaborations around the world to make that happen. There is an economic um, issue between the price to the user and the cost of production by the producer that we need to close. And that that's what requires the collaboration and the, the contribution of all the different types of um, stakeholders around the world, from airlines, from governments, from fuel producers, from OEMs. Um, everybody's got a role to play in making this truly commercially viable at commercial scale. In addition to, to our collaboration efforts, and Eco Demonstrator is actually a collaboration effort of itself, we've been using this as a means to walk the talk. So we have used sustainable aviation fuel on every Eco Demonstrator program going back to 2012. Um, the vast majority of, of flights have flown on some amount of, of biofuel or sustainable fuel. In some cases, we were doing active um, testing of the fuel, such as green diesel, HEFA plus, which we continue to still believe is a, is a viable pathway for aviation, and doing the, the first 100% paraffinic fuel flights on a commercial airliner. Um, this has given us a, a way of um, contributing to the industry and buying fuel um, and, and supporting the producers, as well as, as I said, walking the talk as a user of fuels in addition to helping spur the, the collaboration around the world. Um, over the past couple of years, we've pivoted from getting essentially boutique batches of fuels to using commercially available supplies of fuel. We've worked with our partners, World Energy and Epic Aviation, and Sky Energy in some cases, to um, deliver the fuel on a commercial basis using a you know, log logistics program we set up to make this fuel more readily available, more easily available at our, at our test operation centers. And we then use that logistics to make it offerable to our airline customers to use on delivery flights. And as Miriam um, noted, using that, this fuel on an Etihad delivery flight was something we did um, earlier this year. Um, is something we continue to offer to, to various airline customers. Etihad was also the, the first airline in the world to do, take the first uh, delivery flight using biofuel way back in 2012. So Etihad has been part of our partnership for a very long time. Um, 
We're presently doing uh, an eco demonstrator program with Etihad. Um, airplane is flew to its um, next test site uh, yesterday. Um, and actually, I'm go headed over to the test site myself tomorrow to, to witness some of the testing. That all of that testing will be done using sustainable aviation fuels throughout the test program. Um, so again, it's um, Boeing and Etihad demonstrating our support for sustainable aviation fuels um, in our day-to-day -day operations, in this case, test operations. Now, there's been a lot of um, interest expressed on alternative energy options beyond sustainable fuels. Electrification started getting a lot of attention a couple of years ago, probably three years ago at this point, spurred by the continued development of um, battery electric technology, battery storage technology, and looking to apply that into the urban air mobility market. Um, there's been a number of studies looking at to apply that into future commercial airliners. There's now been the first um, test flights of um, a truly electric, full electric powered airplanes, nine passenger and less airplanes that can have short range, but have true potential commercial operations. But if we're really looking at the mainstream airline business, say 50 passengers and above, the true commercial airline markets, there are real limitations to what electrification can provide due to the, due to the limitations of, of battery and electric storage. Hydrogen has gotten a lot of um, attention over the past 12 months or so. That has similar but different limitations associated with it. Not the least of which in both of those cases is the infrastructure compatibility of the airplane itself, and the viability for that airplane once the technology is available for it to penetrate the fleet. Which leads us back to sustainable aviation fuel really having the greatest addressable reach into the commercial aviation market and why it continues to be a focus and an essential component of our strategy going forward. The other aspects that are an interesting comparison between these two paths, sustainable aviation fuels, electrification, is that the sustainable fuels is, is not a technology limitation, it's really an economic limitation. It's a business model, it's a business physics issue. We need investment and incentives to make it happen. Electrification, hydrogen, there are fundamental technology issues that need to be overcome before it can scale up to providing a substantial contribution to emissions reduction. That's not to say we're not pursuing it. We are pursuing it. We're aggressively pursuing it. We're part of this WISC program depicted here on the right-hand side of the screen as Boeing, but we're not relying on it. We need to be pursuing an all-of-the-above approach. We'll be continuing to develop the conventional technologies of airplanes and gas turbine engines continuing to work on the operational efficiency in the ATM while, and while at the same time looking at these alternative energy options and these tr energy transition options for electrification for hydrogen and for sustainable fuel. And lastly, carbon offsetting for the, at least for the short and medium term is an essential component of our strategy in the industry. It is a credible means of reducing aviation when there aren't other means of reducing the emissions directly or through reducing the emissions of the life cycle of the fuel. So we continue to support carbon offsetting through the Corsia program and other um, airline specific independent means of applying carbon offsets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. I think um, you know the Boeing company has been uh, a leader in this space for many, many years. And, and you and Darren and, and many of, of people that work at the Boeing company have been at the forefront of this. Uh, as you mentioned, the project that we have here in the in the UAE is not the only project, and, uh, but I think that you have a very uh, you know, wide ranging uh, view of what uh, sustainable aviation fuels are, what they need to be, and, and what we need to do to, to make, to bring them to fruition. So um, thank you very much. And we will uh, come back to many of the points you raised, hopefully uh, at the end of the, uh, of the, of the presentations. Um, as I understand it, uh, Darren does not have a presentation and, and he's not able to show his video, but um, uh, Darren, with all of your experience, both at the Boeing company and now with uh, Sky Energy, who is if, if not the only, one of the major distributors of sustainable aviation fuels uh, around the world. Uh, can you please uh, give us an overview of what Sky Energy does and what your vision uh, for sustainable aviation fuels is as, as, you know, 
as, as what has happened in the past and as we move forward. So can you uh, please go ahead, Darren? Yeah, thank you, Alejandro, and uh, welcome everybody. I apologize for not being able to share video. I've got the various technical and personal logistical situations happening today. Um, greetings here from the Netherlands. Um, um, as Sean pointed out, I used to work for Boeing for a long time. The reason Sean looks so uh, chipper and, and well rested at such an early hour is because he no longer has to manage me. And, um, but, but we still have a very good relationship. Um, so uh, Sky Energy started uh, a little over a decade ago. Um, my first meeting with them when I was with Boeing was I think in 2010 or 11. Um, and it was clear that they were going to provide an important service uh, that was needed at the time. And it was also clear that their role over time was going to change or need to change and, and has now changed. So what started out as a, a company to cause a market that didn't exist where buyers and sellers really could not come together because of technical barriers and uh, commercial barriers and policy barriers. Um, the, the people here uh, that brought Sky Energy together uh, decided to solve those barriers in a, in a typical Dutch way, you know, making a market the way the Dutch are very good at doing where one doesn't exist. Um, they did that. Uh, and uh, not with the idea in mind that they would be the um, ultimately the, you know, any kind of dominant or leading uh, player in, in the grand scheme of things for, for SAF to be successful on the scale that everybody's talking about and that we hope for as Sky Energy. You know, Sky Energy cannot be uh, as, as prominent as it had been in the marketplace over the past decade. We've been an essential player um, in all those ways that I just talked about, um, but we can't be the only ones in this space at the level that we're at now. And the good news is from our perspective, it's clear that that's not going to be the case um, for a lot longer. There are a lot of other players coming into this space and that's a very, very good thing for us. Um, if you've ever heard of the, uh, the sauce Sriracha, which was a, a, a sauce, uh, Asian sauce uh, on food developed in the United States by a Vietnamese immigrant. Um, he very famously, the inventor of that, did not patent it and did not trademark it, did not turn it into just his thing because his view was he would sell more by others coming into the space and promulgating the name and the brand of Sriracha. And those who wanted the best would come to him, even though there were other people out there selling things called Sriracha. And that's now kind of about what we're doing. Um, we don't believe um, we need to be the alpha and omega of SAF. We just want to be um, the ones with the highest sustainability standards. Our part of the market is going to be the, those who to choose to take the high road and have higher standards on sustainability than anybody else. That's our target market. That's who we're after. Um, and the reason we're doing that from a, from a, it's a, it's a moral perspective, which is that's just the right thing to do, but it's a strategic and we think wise business approach because there's one shot to get this industry launched in the right way. Uh, you only get one shot at this. And if you don't take the high road and you take a low road or you go to the bare minimum legal requirement of what is necessary on sustainability, which, you know, some are choosing that path, um, that runs the risk of creating a problem that you then later have to fix. Well, we're already by in the, in the domain of having to switch energy sources. We already have a problem in aviation that we need to fix. We have to change our energy source. That's already a problem. We don't need to add another problem, which is change the new energy source that we just started using to be better. So our approach as a business and as, a, um, as citizens of the planet is we're gonna take this, the high road and let others do other things. But in taking the high road, we hope to convince others that that's the right way to go. Um, and um, so far that, that, that's working well. We have major stakeholders that have stepped up and are willing to go down that road with us. And, um, and that's what we're very focused on. Uh, I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about where we're going. I think uh, we're built as a distributor. We are getting into the production space as well. Um, we do come from uh, that background of, of being the ones to help bring buyers and sellers together uh, sur surmount the technical barriers that, that are slowly going away. Um, but our future is definitely into production because of what I just said. We want to keep the bar high um, and keep moving the technology needle forward. We think there's a very strong nexus between high sustainability and high technology. And we want, we want to be on the cutting edge without being on the bleeding edge. And we're 
so far doing that in a way that we feel is, uh, is, 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 is done well. Um, a little bit on kind of the, the mechanics, the, the unglorious um, kind of inner workings of things that happen in this space that you've been hearing people talk about thus far, and, you know, what we've done in the past and what we continue to do today. Um, so Arvid mentioned the Itaka program, which we were part of. So one of the things that occurred in Itaka, it was kind of a proof of concept early on, relatively early on by the EU to say, okay, get the feedstock, get the production, get the supply and distribution in place in a way that is a, proto, a prototype uh, of a marketplace. And so our role was basically to facilitate making sure those steps could occur. We weren't the producer, um, we weren't the consumer, but we were the ones uh, asked to help facilitate. Um, and what ended up occurring is the, the most important outcome from that program, in my view, this is a personal view, others can have other views, I'm sure, is there were mistakes made and the learning from those mistakes helped the, this little industry um, with um, some important uh, insights that got built into some of the participants' future business plans because of those mistakes and problems that cropped up. Um, and so in, in, I can give you like an example without, I won't go into details of naming names, but um, one of the batches of fuel was off spec, couldn't be brought on the spec uh, with the means that that had been applied. Um, and so we and that producer found a place to send the fuel to do an extra little step to get the fuel on the spec in the meantime, because that was going to take a while and there were milestones by the program set in place. Um, you know, customer, in the case of the Euro European Commission, demanded performance by a certain date, which was a good thing to be doing. So we were able to put a backup plan in place and have a backup supplier to supply some initial quantities from a different location uh, in the interim period of time that that um, that problem fix got worked and the fuel finally got onto spec and got into the plane. So while the the um, the uh, the visible part of the program was that plane getting up in the air, metaphorically and literally. Um, the real learning from that, the real value of that program was the fact that mistakes were made and the consortium of parties involved were able to triage and problem solve. And then that got, that was a lesson learned that got wired back into some business cases and some technology approaches. Um, you know, really um, uh, crunchy detailed technical things that ended up um, mattering a lot in the commercial outcome. So those were more early days. Those kind of problems are, are more, more in the past than not. Um, and, uh, and because of all of that learning, we realized, plus the earlier issue I talked about, about taking a high on sustainability, we realized rather than just be the intermediary, we want to get into production. So we, several years ago, started investigating doing a, um, uh, production facility in the in the Netherlands um, that was announced uh, last year. Um, KLM is the primary off taker of 75% of that fuel. It's a relatively small hydro treating facility producing HEFA from really 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 dirty uh, waste oils that, that can be sourced from within the region immediately, um, and therefore uh, we are out of the realm of having to worry about um, questionable feedstocks in terms of sustainability. We don't have to touch anything related to palm or anything that could be called palm by another name, et cetera. So we sized our plant in the North of the Netherlands specifically to be going after those types of feedstocks, um, uh, which means it's a little bit more expensive to build the plant, um, but it's going to be uh, in our investors and our off taker in our view, uh, a better um, formula in the long run for that particular location and that particular region of, of the Netherlands and KLM. Um, kind of inserting a bit of Sean's point about COVID, um, you know, obviously with the airline industry and the challenged position, um, it was very, very good. And to Sean's point about how governments and others are still prioritizing climate, even in these times, the Dutch government has decided to do so and have stepped in and specifically in um, helping KLM um, cope with their challenges right now and have called out specifically that they will step up and support um, our facility, the, the direct supply line, we call it DSL01 facility here in the Netherlands. Um, we are actively involved in other projects uh, in development uh, right now in other regions, Europe and elsewhere. Uh, won't be able to talk about that right now too much, uh, but suffice it to say, um, we do have a global strategy. It is underway. We will likely be building more plants, uh, but not any more plants than we can do so sustainably and reasonably as a small company. 
Um, so, so that's where we came from. That's where we're going. Thank you very much, Darren. Um, I think that you have uh, given us a, a good perspective on what uh, Sky Energy is doing and where you think uh, for your case, or the case of Sky Energy, uh, where it makes sense to go uh, from here. So um, I'd like to open now the floor uh, for a discussion. Um, and so, you know, uh, there is uh, one question uh, in the Q&A uh, box, and I would like to remind everyone in the session that you are able to type in questions if you wish, um, and we will try to address them as, uh, as we go along. Uh, but related to the question that we see um, on the, on the Q&A box, uh, it has to do with uh, how, how the Norway mandate is working so far. I would like to take it a, state, a step further and ask each of you what you think uh, is the role of policy for getting these fuels off the ground. Uh, you know, for many years we have talked about trying to reach this 1% threshold that is as soon as we reach 1% of the market share in, in sustainable aviation fuels, we will be able to you know, start going into this hockey stick uh, type of uh, uptake in the sense that the market will, will start becoming viable and more and more sustainable aviation fuels will be coming into the market. And so can each of you just briefly tell me what you think uh, is needed to really, uh, you know, maybe it's a mandate as, as uh, Avenor is, as, has been able to establish. Um, maybe there are other incentives uh, such as uh, Sean uh, clearly alluded to. Uh, you know, from the airline perspective, from the airport perspective, from the from the aircraft manufacturer, and from a producer distributor such as Sky Energy, what do you think uh, is needed for us to to really start reaching a a critical mass or a critical point uh, where sustainable aviation fuels start becoming more mainstream? And perhaps we can start with um, with Darren, and we'll go the other way around. So, can, can you give us your 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 view on this, Darren? And then we'll move back uh, at, as the order was was established. Sure. Uh, prior to Boeing, I was as Alejandro mentioned in my bio, is we're a company called Puget Energy, we're the main um, power producer for the Pacific Northwest, um, and we were buying. Um, uh, new power because the, the hydroelectric in the region was was now tapped out there was fully used and so more power plants had to be built in the region to supply power so we moved aggressively into renewables and the reason we did that as a, an investor owned commercial utility was because the price of wind and solar had started to collapse to the point where it was commercially viable and the reason that happened in the united states was because of a steady and reliable policy mechanism called the production tax credit system and when that was implemented in the United States, that's when commercial enterprises like my former employer, Puget Energy, could crunch the numbers and make a viable business decision to invest in renewables. That was you know, 15 plus years ago now. And of course now, uh, you know, the renewables are lower cost than the fossil options and you know, the game is on. Um, but that took a long time. And in Europe, of course, there were similar policies in place for a very long time. Um, the technology had to be perfected, but the steady, consistent, long-term, certain policy mechanisms were there long enough to enable um, renewable energy to exist in other sectors. That's going to have to be in place for um, renewable fuels, uh, as well as obviously for sustainable fuels. Um, it's starting to be, uh, some of the other people mentioned, the, the Norwegian mandate. Um, others are looking at similar. That doesn't necessarily have to be the, the mechanism everywhere. Um, as long as it's a steady enough um, mechanism that when you go to present a business case saying, yeah, this stuff's going to be more expensive, but here's this mechanism. And on that basis, it's cost competitive. And we've got, you know, customers that are willing to be patient enough to, to, to wait for the production to be online. Those, are, those business cases are starting close. We just closed one. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the way the Dutch government in this particular case um, allows for an on-ramp for sustainable aviation fuel into the EU's um, uh, 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 mechanism for renewable fuels. 
Um, it's peculiar to how the Netherlands interpreted the EU's um, directive on that topic. And in the US, as people probably know, the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard is doing now allowing aviation fuels to be um, counting towards the LCFS's requirements. That's causing all this stimulation of the market in California. So those mechanisms are starting to get, you know, get in place. Um, it's just, you know, there has to be more and more of that. And then, um, you know, eventually the prices will go down. They already are going down. It's just that it's early days. Uh, Sean? Yeah, so I think Darren um, hit on what I, one of the things I like to, to emphasize, and that's it, we've got an example in California that this can work, that the vast majority of the, the sustainable aviation fuel that's being produced today is finding its way to California because there are incentives there that make it economically viable for both the airlines and the fuel producers. So we know it can work. The, uh, what the right incentive mechanism is for a given part of the world, whether it's a state in the US or a country in the Middle East, I think is the choice of those local stakeholders, the governments, the airlines, the fuel producers in, in the region to find the model that works best for them. So Norway's made a choice. Um, has chosen uh, a, a low level mandate um, that's hopefully is going to work for them. Um, we don't think there's one size that fits all incentive mechanism for every part of the world and it, and it needs to be a collaboration process to decide what it is, but we do know that it can work. We do know that we need incentives for the producers and the end users to close the economic gap. And we also know that we need support on the capital investment side to enable companies like Sky Energy to stand up new um, production capacity. That's a different type of economic support mechanism that, that's needed. Um, and that has you know, been demonstrated to be effective in the US where they've helped support some of the burgeoning fuel producers going on here. And that kind of thing is getting set up in, in parts of Europe as well. Thank you, Sean. Um, you're absolutely right. Those are very important aspects that we, we in a way, we need to consider uh, all of the different parts of the supply chain. And, and this is, you know, sort of what we were trying to do in this session. We were trying to, to look at, uh, you know, the perspective from a producer, the perspective from, from the users, the airlines, and, and, and of course, everything passes through an airport. And so, uh, Arvid, uh, you know, going back to this question, what can you, what can you tell us from your perspective? Um. So just uh, uh, pure technicalities around the, the mandate uh, first. Uh, the obligation is, is on the fuel uh, suppliers. Uh, so uh, all the fuel suppliers in Norway uh, supplying to aviation will have to show uh, that they have provided uh, half a percentage of bio uh, over the air uh, to aviation. So uh, uh, I... Um, I mean, I know it's not, it's not really part of the fuel supply chain. Uh, so this is taken care of by the fuel suppliers uh, and the airlines. Uh, but I don't, I haven't heard that any bio has been supplied under the mandate yet. Uh, so it can all be supplied in uh, November, December, uh, but it just has to be done uh, well, during the year. Um, and of course, the, the volume will be lower than, than estimated. But uh, uh, Norway um, and Norwegian as aviation has, has received positive attention uh, for taking this, this first step. Uh, but of course, uh, there's, uh, there are matters of, of industry uh, competition um, and competitiveness. So uh, if one thing is, is having a mandate of half a percentage but uh, if, if you look at a mandate of 30%, I mean, it's, it's hard to do that uh, moving alone at least. Uh, you'll have problems of, of tankering uh, and you'll have problems of competitiveness for local, well, for our own airlines. Uh, so we're looking at costs of hundreds of millions of dollars or euros when moving to these higher uh, portions of, of bio. Um, so, so we're curious also here, I mean, uh, if it would be only a mandate and if, well, what, what other countries will do, what the European Union uh, will do, they're looking at this uh, at the moment. Um, we're also uh, 
curious how the mix of taxes and mandate will be in Norway in the years to, to come for, for aviation. Um, will uh, some of the taxes that uh, aviation uh, is now uh, paying uh, have to move into uh, to providing uh, aviation, uh, to providing sustainable fuels? Uh, and we're also curious uh, about uh, the technical, uh, technological developments. Uh, what will happen in the in the, in the field of e-fuels? Uh, much is going on there. Uh, how how should that be seen in sustainability uh, through sustainability glasses? Uh, what will happen uh, in terms of uh, uh, forests, uh, biomaterials, algae, other uh, materials than, and processes than, than HEPA, the fish drops, uh, and those forest uh, residues coming up, uh, co-processing, uh, and uh, of course this, this process of approval for, for HEPA plus, of course, will change the, the market. Um, so I think, uh, I think it's, it's, it's all needed, um, and we're very uh, curious how of other countries will follow uh, Sweden, Finland, the Netherlands, uh, Portugal, Spain, uh, and the EU uh, as as a total. I guess we're following European nations uh, most um, are are discussing this. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Arvid. I, I I think you've raised a couple of very interesting points that I would like to come back to. But uh, you know, first, uh, Mariam, do you have something to say uh, along these lines? Yes, Dr. Alejandro, I think um, the uptake for SAFs is both slow and low, although it is commercially viable, is because we, I think you, you, you touched on the point, we, we really need political instruments to push it. Um, we as a carrier service people at the end, and um, now that I think our, 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 um, our guests or travelers are becoming more eco-conscious, we feel that this is not just it's not just important for us to service the environment but also service our our clients so there's another push from from um uh the um you know our travelers but also i think with corsia uh safs are are, are gaining a lot of uh, attention as the easiest commercially viable option uh, uh, along with the carbon offsets so i think this is if, if I think now is the better, best time to, because we can push the restart button and look into what we can do. But um, as an industry, I think also the environment is sometimes um, sidetracked because of um, safety. So there's sometimes a conflict uh, between safety and environment in a way, which, um, for example, away from SAFs, but if I look into um, introducing things that uh, cabin waste, for example. If I look into a way where we can not um, simply incinerate cabin waste, um, I, this presents health risks. So probably I think SAFs, moving back to SAFs, is not high on the agenda now um, because of that, but I think it, it comes down to um, regulatory uh, bodies and um, uh, governments to enforce that. And um, um, I, I think Corsia is going to be the way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam. Um, I, you know, talking about that interaction between what you were saying, Mariam, and, and what Arvid was saying, and, and, and in a way, all of you were saying, we have uh, the case of, of Norway was it's a very interesting case because Norway has, uh, Arvid mentioned this, this capacity that if they turned you know, they, you know they, their bio-based capacity because of the forests they have and all of the residual uh, material that, that comes from forest uh, management, uh, about 30 to 40% of their internal jet fuel demand, if I'm not mistaken, Arvid, uh, you, that you quoted, would, co would come potentially mm. or could come potentially from, uh, mm. from these uh, forest residues. Uh, but you also have, uh, Norway is a country where uh, most, if not all of your electricity uh, today comes from renewable sources. I think that most of your electricity comes from uh, hydro uh, power. Um, and so you have a low carbon source of electricity. 
Uh, and there is a, a market, uh, I guess, pioneer in, in one of the companies that has come out in, in Norway, pushing this idea of, the, and then you mentioned it, the electrofuel idea, right? That if you take, and there's been a significant push in Europe of, uh, for, for trying to, to do research under the Horizon 2020 program uh, on, on these electrofuels or power to liquids or power to X. Um, and so these are very interesting uh, avenues, specifically when we're talking about the UAE. Uh, the UAE is a place where we have no biomass. It's not like Norway, where 30 to 40 percent uh, of the fuel demand can come from bio-based sources. Uh, there really isn't uh, many uh, or any bio-based sources here. We are working on a on a on a, on a potential pathway which uh, includes the use of halified biomass to produce bio-based uh, fuels. Uh, uh, but the reality of it is that even if we're very successful in doing that, we're going to be able to pro to produce. A, a small amount of fuel or a, or, or a, you know, a percentage, it'll be part of the portfolio of options. But if we're going to try to reach scale, specifically in a place like the UAE, where we have a significant amount of jet fuel consumption, we're going to have to look at other alternatives. And, and some of those other alternatives are these uh, electrofuels or power to liquids. And so, you know, can, can you, Arvid, and perhaps uh, Sean and Darren, give, you, give us uh, some perspective along these lines? Uh, and if um, you can start, okay. Yeah. Yes, I guess, I guess I could start. Yes, please. Um, um, yes, uh, it's, it's correct that uh, we have uh, uh, we've been meeting um, some um, players in the PTL. Um, I mean, um, uh, within PTL and electrofuels. Uh, and they're looking at Norway specifically, because uh, if you if you are to produce uh, sustainable e-fuels, uh, the electricity must be green. Uh, and Norway is is kind of a special place there. Uh, of course, you could set up uh, you could set up dedicated uh, electricity production uh, off grid uh, to produce hydrogen, uh, and then you wouldn't kind of rely on the uh, the renewable percentage of, of the country or the region, uh, but uh, so, so I guess for for uh, the Middle East uh, having uh, cheap electricity production through solar, for example, uh, producing hydrogen uh, out of that uh, and connecting that to CO two from direct air capture. That sounds like a very viable or very, very prosperous um, direction uh, to go. To go. Uh, but of course, direct air capture is, um, I'm not sure about the technology. I mean, uh, how, how close is it to, <laughs> to, commercial, um, to commercialization? Uh, there are companies uh, with this technology now but uh, uh, they and they uh, they project that prices will will fall. Um, but normally these e fuel projects they start from um, from capturing CO two from industrial emissions, uh, and you should you shouldn't kind of uh, use that as a reason to uh, to not uh, reduce CO two emissions uh, that you have with such a e fuel production facility. But, but I'd say as as you uh, as you um, kind of uh, talk about that, if you have no local or little local bio uh, materials, then uh, looking at other options um, would be uh, you know, sounds wise. Yeah. Thank you, Arvid. Uh, Sean. Um, yeah, it's, it's not a case of, can you make it work? It's, you know, technically speaking, it's, it's been proven at, at small scales. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's really a question of, of the economics and also the, the choice of how to deploy your, your renewable energy. So if it, you know, going from direct air capture um, through renewable energy to a liquid fuel, is not an energy efficient process. Uh, 
So for it to make sense, you need to have really low cost renewable energy. And that's, you know, it's just like certain feedstocks are, are limited in, in certain parts of the world, like the Middle East. Um, re cheap renewable energy is limited to certain regions of the world as well. Fortunately, Middle East is a region where cheap renewable energy is viable. Um, so it, that may be a region where it makes sense, but it, but it's not necessarily universally the, the right thing to do, um, depending on where you are in the world and what your energy choices are. Uh, Darren, briefly. Uh, Sean is spot on there. Uh, there is a big push in the EU, especially for e-fuels. There's a lot of reasons why that exists. Some of them a bit of conflict of interest by incumbents. Um, we are participating in e-fuels projects actively. Uh, we're to be, to be knowing where the cutting edge versus the bleeding edge is. Uh, agree with what has been said prior. It's just there. Um, it's a very inefficient process generally. You can get industrial emissions to uh, substitute for direct air capture, but then the problem becomes what are you really doing here? And it's a it's at risk of be getting um, in the European Union. It's a risk of getting. Uh, it's a risk. It's at risk of getting a lot of people's um, attention focused on the wrong outcome. Uh, that's what we see. Even though we're optimistic about it, um, because of places like the UAE and in places around like North Africa with high solar insulation values, with very low cost energy because there's so much sun. Yes, it does make sense there more than anywhere else. Um, our concern here in, in Europe is that it's getting a lot of attention. It's a bit of a bandwagon. And sometimes bandwagons are not the right place to be for everybody. Um, but for, for you all down there, uh, it, it definitely is, if it makes sense anywhere, it makes sense there. One other piece I would add is we're talking about policy mechanisms on a poll basis, you know, uh, um, mandates, et cetera. Um, there's another piece here, which is um, most would agree that if you're seeking sustainable stuff to put into a bio process, go after waste materials uh, first, uh, and then go after, uh, you know, other things. And so that's, that's we, we agree with that. That's why we're structuring our project in the Netherlands to go after the really dirty stuff that nobody else wants. Um, but with respect to municipal solid waste, and in the case of SBRC, aquaculture where a large aquaculture industry produces a lot of waste in the form of fish waste. Um, anywhere where those costs are not borne by the producer uh, of those wastes, it's going to be very difficult to make a business case close to use those waste streams. So in, in places where municipal solid waste is viable as a potential feedstock for SAF or other things like SAF, that's only viable because the, the, the people that are producing it um, are paying what's called a tipping fee. And that when that tipping fee gets directed at the, at the solution to the problem of that uh, accumulating waste, the people that are building the, the SAF plant or, or some process that's gonna take the municipal solid waste, when part of that tipping fee gets allocated to those people, that closes a business case really quickly. Uh, in some cases without mandates or without um, LCFS type mechanism, just by getting the tipping fees. But, um, or in the case of aquaculture, if, a, if an aquaculture en en enterprise has to pay for the pollution that they're providing into the watershed because their, their fish are producing waste and it's going to the watershed, if they're not paying for that, it's gonna make it very hard to make it economical to build a system that's based on fish waste. But if they are having to pay and that part of that economic value is captured by the system that's making the fuel or other bioproduct, um, that will close the business case as well. And so the key here on the, the, on the supply side for wastes and residuals is the, the polluter of those residuals need to be paying somebody and part of that economic value needs to go to the, to the, the bio processor, whether it's SAF or anything else, that's um, helping to solve the problem. Uh, very good. I think, uh, you know, we could <laughs> clearly we have uh, you know top experts around the world uh, discussing this and, and we could talk about this uh, for hours hours on end but uh, unfortunately we have run out of time uh, and so but before we close I would just like to you know ask you to each of you give me a or give us a a, a very short uh, view on, on the future of sustainable aviation fuels how do you see sustainable aviation fuels uh, you know, 
becoming uh, a, a significant part of our everyday lives. Uh, and we can start uh, with uh, Sean uh, and then uh, move down the line, please, Sean. So how is SAF um, gonna be part of um, everyday lives? Uh, I'm looking forward to when SAF is available for everything. It's completely normalized across the industry. Obviously, we have a long ways to go there, but um, you know, I I continue to believe and I continue to, to give a message that this is possible. Um, we just need to make it probable and just. There's a lot, there's a lot loaded in that just word, um, but I think all of us here are, are are working on that just to to get to from possible to probable. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Arvid. Mm. Yes, uh, I think um, I think the uh, uh, introduction of sustainable aviation fuel must happen. Uh, it is necessary in order to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement uh, that most of the countries of the world uh, have committed uh, to. Uh, so, although aviation is is a typical or a uh, yeah a typical hard to decarbonize sector with high high cost. Of CO2 reduction, uh, the sector must take its share. Uh, and uh, you also write a bit about it in the invitation that this is connected to the, the industry's license license to grow. And people will continue to to want to travel, uh, so the industry will need to find ways uh, to solve the emission problem. Uh, and I think uh, incentives are are needed. Policies are needed. Um, and the, the best option is, is having them at an international level. Um, but uh, until now, uh, Corsia has been uh, too weak uh, an incentive. Uh, so uh, it has to be, there has to be more power to it. Uh, and the ETS uh, is, is a stronger um, incentive. Uh, but in addition, normal well, countries Individual individual countries will have to will have to show the way, uh, and I think also uh, as Mariam also pointed to that that individual passengers uh, could take some of the load or responsibility. That uh, there will be a demand, uh, only not only from governments but also from individual travelers and passengers. So um, I'm I'm um, positive looking into the future. Thank you, Harvey, uh, Mariam. You know, I think, Dr. Alejandro, um, the way I see things move forward is I, SAPs are, I mean, we have to go through, uh, we have to move to SAPs. It's not, uh, it's just a matter of time when, when, when we see that there will be no more fossil fuel, jet fuel, and we will have to look at alternatives. But I think the, the only way forward at the moment should be, or at least in, in this region, because we don't have coalitions that support SAPs, um, academic, um, I think we need some more, more collaborations um, across academia and industry and government to, to see that the uptake is increasing or uh, worldwide, at least in this region, because we, I, it, if prices is an issue, I think in a way this region has um, an abundance in resources, and we are re-injecting a lot of the fossil fueled um, uh, um, money into sustainable uh, or renewable energy. So why not SAFs? Um, I'm very optimistic. I think um, we will see SAFs uh, hopefully post COVID um, because there was a question about it being affected by COVID. So the, um, rise in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, and Darren, uh, your final thoughts. Sure. Uh, picking up on Miriam's final point there, uh, you know, and hopefully the tying to the hockey stick phenomenon that I think Sean mentioned, um, we are seeing that the COVID crisis and the the global realization that we're on one planet and global problems have to be tackled and the sort of acceleration of concern that COVID has brought about about climate that we are seeing from a lot of our stakeholders, not that we all of our stakeholders are relevant to everybody, 
but the ones that we're seeing, this crisis has doubled down a lot of people's efforts on climate and has accelerated some of our efforts. Um, particularly uh, to, to, again, Miriam's point about the customer, the, the airline customers, um, the airline's customer, a lot of support coming from those corporate travelers, individual travelers, um, into programs that we have that face those, that market segment, sometimes with airlines, sometimes on our own. So between all of these different things, um, you know, you, you, we are seeing what could be a hockey stick phenomenon. It's hockey stick for us, but of course we're a little company. So a hockey stick for us does not make a global hockey stick, but, but I'm happy with a little hockey stick. That's the one nice thing not, about not working at Boeing where I have to worry about global hockey sticks. I get to worry about a nice little, you know, cup of tea that I have to make well, not boiling an ocean. But, um, but if we can do it at a little small level, then it can be multiplied. That's the thing. If it, it, it starts with, you mentioned 1%. If you don't get to 1%, you can't get to 10% or 50% or 100%. And so as a little company like ours is having success, you know, it, it's a good indicator, canary in the coal mine, the canary is still alive and, and, and this canary is doing pretty well at a time of crisis. It's a good indicator that there's potentially a global hockey stick uh, phenomenon coming. Um, the US uh, changing its policies in a significant way would help a lot. Let's wait and see, um, optimistic. Um, but even without that, there's so much impetus in other sectors. Um, we are seeing no shortage of support, financial policy and other. Okay. Uh, I, you know, I can't thank you enough, all of you for all of your perspectives. I think it's, has been a, an incredibly interesting session. Um, I, I, you know, there's nothing else to do here, but to thank each of you, Mariam, Arvid, uh, Sean, Darren. I would also like to thank our sponsors, Etihad Airways, the Boeing Company, the General Civil Aviation Authority of the UAE, IATA, and of course, uh, our new sponsor as well, Emirates Airlines as well. So thank you all for supporting our efforts. And uh, we will be seeing you next week with our session five, which is uh, the role of the oil and gas industry uh, in the development of sustainable aviation fuels. So please tune in to that. It will be next Tuesday. And so hopefully I will see many of you there. Uh, thank you again. And with that, um, we will close this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, thank you.